गुड मॉर्निंग और गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी डिपेंडिंग वेर एवर वट इव वट एवर इज योर टाइम फ्रेम एंड वेलकम बैक टू दिस कोर्स ऑन स्टैटिकल मैकेनिक्स फॉर केमिस्ट्री एंड मेटेरियल साइंटिस्ट दिस इज एंशियल कोर्स फॉर इक्विब्रियम स्टैटिकल मैकेनिक्स एंड वी हैव बीन स्टार्टिंग ऑफ लेट पॉलीमर द फिजिकल केमिस्ट्री ऑफ पॉलीमर and uh, uh the picture that you see on the slide in front of you is that of uh, paul flory who played an enormous role in fashioning this subject uh, before i proceed further let me tell you this course will be little different from the earlier courses which were recorded in bombay iit studio uh this one is uh because of the um, corona virus epidemic i am recording it from home so you won't be able to see me but rest of the things will be okay uh you'll be able to see the slides and you'll be able to follow and what i'll do uh go to revise the course first 5 10 minutes of what i did in the last class and then we will uh, go into do some uh, new things this might be a bit of a longish class uh, but uh, and there will be some expressions and derivations but we will not derive the uh, we will don't derive the lengthy equations but i'll sketch the derivation and you will find the derivations in my uh, in my book on uh, the same title of the course and uh, there are two other books i want to bring to your attention one is the book by paul flory on principles of polymer chemistry and there is book by dijan uh, pr dijan on scaling concepts in polymer science these two books together just uh, will be more than uh, enough <coughs> and as i was telling you about uh, paul flory uh, who uh, created almost the uh, a much of what we know about polymer science today and he is rightfully called the father of polymer chemistry he got nobel prize in 1974 and there are many many things that he did in polymer and he did both theory and experiment and which is remarkable because he did theory at a very high level Paul Flory was born in 1910 uh, in a place in Illinois near Chicago and he graduated from Ohio State University and then joined industry and from industry he then moved to Cornell University and at the Cornell where he did much of his pioneer work uh, and he also <coughs> uh published his book from the Cornell University now the next slide uh, i give the plan of the lecture uh, so this is something we did uh, in the last lecture polymer size end to end distribution and with a, with an a, a, a random walk analogy it takes you to gaussian distribution and then we started polymer thermodynamics we'll do little bit more of polymer thermodynamics and we'll now talk two kinds of transitions in polymer two kinds of phase transition one is a sol gel transition by the reason of doing it is that it is Bring, it it bears close similarity to mayer's theory of uh, condensation gas to liquid transition <clears throat> it is just is a kind of a clustering transition here sol means solution of monomers the monomers uh, connect together to form a branched uh, polymer and which is then become a highly viscous solution is a very in important industrial uh, uh, process and is used widely uh, as i have told you already that polymer is one of the most important part of our daily life and uh, from textile to rubber to many many things that we use every day for example the uh, your diode in many things is organic semiconductor is a polymer mehppv so 
uh, and these many of these things are made by some kind of a solgil transition. So, it is an important thing. So, we will just uh, go through this in a rather uh, simple fashion uh, without the blackboard. I uh, will be more qualitative, but I will show the equations. So, in the third slide, I briefly do the overview that a, a polymer that we think that millions and millions of connected monomers, monomers themselves are somewhat complex molecules. <coughs> and, uh, and we, we polymerize them, means we add these monomers together. And uh, many of the fast applications of uh, so, polymer since is a many is a, a large system with a large number of monomers, it is a natural playground of statistical mechanics. And one of the important property of this polymer is end to end distribution function of a polymer, which is expressed in terms of number of monomers and which is the end and the between the monomers. We will talk of uh, effective interaction, solvent effect, and we will talk of uh, several other remarkable properties and some uh, observations that we have got. <coughs> in the next day, we showed the random coil polymer chain and this is a, a kind of a ribbon diagram and you can see the two open ends of the polymer and in between that there is a long contour where the connected uh, chain connection, connected of monomers is kind of it takes a random zigzag fashion. And that's why it is called a, a random walk. One of the reason that it is so random lies in the chemistry, you know, in a basic chemistry. And that is when I uh, start with A0 to A1, and the beginning to the first bond between A0 and A1, that bond, many of these are uh, CC single bond, carbon carbon single bond. And they can take this tetrahedral geometry. That means that that means it can rotate in three dimension. <coughs> so that bond can take many many uh, directions, and then the next one. So you join one bond to the, uh, which already can rotate in many directions to another bond which again can take many directions. So between, if we, by the time I have ten some bonds connected and each of them take many, many configurations, we already have huge number of uh, configuration space that means rotational configuration space that uh, this polymer can enjoy and that's a very important property of the polymer this huge number of configuration space the configuration degrees of freedom that a polymer enjoys uh, because of this rotational flexibility or rotational degrees of freedom so these different polymer that uh, arise because of the rotational degrees of freedom, sometimes there is a preference of certain orientations and then one talk of rotational isomer, this is a term which was coined by Russian scientist Wolkenstein and which Flory also used later. So in this slide that we are showing that we are starting one, then we have these different bonds and then bonds are going and last uh, the other ball at AN. Is the red ball. So this is the uh, ping pong diagram, and uh, in order to get the end-to-end -end distance that be from a1 to a n from one into another end that is called r, the universal notation r, and that is what we uh, mm, that's what we uh, we will calculate now, and that end-to-end -end vector r can be it can be easily seen is nothing but some or all these small small vectors and these are small small bond vectors and each of the bond vector has a lot of independence from uh, other because of the rotational degree of freedom so these uh, bonds arise have the effect because of the vectorial nature the length is could be the same that is the bond length l but their vector so because of the vectorial nature of the bond and the rotational degrees of freedom r is a random number and that um, probability distribution of r is a subject of great interest and that is the one which is a Gaussian distribution as we discussed last class and also we will discuss today. Okay, now this is we discussed but let us discuss again. This is essentially a rough uh, caricature of a polymer which is a ribbon, we call this as a ribbon diagram and you can see there are end-to-end end -to -end distribution 
going on here and these uh, end to end distribution is you can see from uh, one end to the other end that that because of the large intervening <coughs> contour going from one end to the other end uh, which can take many configurations in a certain way it reminds you of a uh, rope or a dangling uh, or dancing rope or snake and this ability to take many many configurations uh, determine the end-to-end -end, uh, distribution so the roughly the size of the polymer when you say size of a polymer we essentially talk of two things how on the average how far is my end is average quantity what is the average distance and since it's a random quantity that average is a mean square you know and this is a very close <coughs> close analogy is random work so as if it has our uh, 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 the monomer to monomer distance is almost as a random work and we'll discuss this now immediately a little bit extremely important to realize that the end-to-end -end distribution along with the end-to-end -end distribution to giving you the size of a polymer there's one more quantity is the radius of gyration radius of gyration is nothing but the uh, kind of moment of inertia that means you take the position and mirri square and sum over and you that gives you also a call rg that also gives you a measure of the size and uh, these two quantities the mean square end-to-end -end distribution size and the radius of gyration are very closely connected to each other they have the same size number of same dependence on number of monomers uh, but they have some numerical factor which make them different from each other so we can use either radius of gyration or mean square root mean square distribution end to end distribution as the a this is what i was telling that we will be discussing a little bit of the random work scenario and then go to a1 a2 a3 and then go over and go to end point that two end points are given by two uh, red um, uh, spheres and one important thing to know here that when I go from A0 to A1 and A1 to A2, then A0 to A1 bond vector can rotate and can take a large number of orientations. <coughs> this, this is not quite 360 degrees because there is some static hindrance posed by uh, a molecular, uh, molecular architecture. But it is fairly flexible that means it can take many many orientations so now you consider that you are orienting uh, one from the other and then to other so by the time you have just eight or ten monomers connected there's a ten mark already you can see a huge number of configurations that can uh, this polymer can take it is extremely important to realize the inherent huge flexibility of a polymer the huge number of internal degrees of freedom the configurational degree of freedom that a polymer enjoys and that is very important part of its properties which Flory realized very early along with Wolkenstein and Wolkenstein coined the name rotational isomer these multiple configurations that polymer gets was recognized by both these two giants of polymer chemistry so now if i want to go end to end distance we call it r then you realize that this is nothing but the sum of the vector just like i know i want to go one place to another place to another place to finally place then where i go finally i if i uh, number of steps then i add up these things in a vector way and that's why vector is important on, uh, depending on orientation that's why orientation is so important so you can now see the end-to-end -end distance, uh, end -end distance, both the vector and the scalar uh, is, is a dynamic quantity and is also random, hugely random because uh, in, you see it now in one position, then if you are in a solution polymer, in a little later you will see in a different position, so it is completely moving around, coiling and uncoiling and things like that. So the way to say that, that we do try to have a uh, an uh, idea of this uh, uh, is what appears to be extremely important, uh, extremely complicated, but it turns out to be not complicated, not only not complicated, it is a beautiful universality 
that Flory Falkenstein uh, realized and later was, I told you, has been enormously exploited in physics, a community where polymer physics is a big subject now. So this is the sum we get, and now we have to get a distribution of this R and R vector. As I told you, R, this R is a, it's a stochastic quantity, it's a random quantity. Now the way to do that, then is one, uh, many ways it can be done. It can be just applied. You don't have to do central limit theorem. We can apply to random walk. But central limit theorem gives a very easy way to access. It's a very uh, well-known theorem when I discussed last time that if I have a quantity S, which is the sum of uh, n number of random uh, quantities, uh, and then this uh, when I sum it up, that sum is a uh, is a Gaussian distribution. That's called central limit theorem. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's a very robust theorem. Uh, as I told you last time, mathematicians are not given to give this kind of name, fundamental theorem, central limit theorem. That's not. There is more in uh, physics and chemistry. We give grandiose name like theory of everything or, or a very great thing, but not mathematicians. They're very conservative people. So when the central limit theorem, it is really central limit, central theorem of probability theory that if I have n number of random variables, I add it up, then that uh, goes over to a Gaussian distribution with a mean uh, u and i. Uh, the mean is very easy to understand in this case because the, well, uh, the, it is rotating. And so you can easily convince yourself the mean would be zero. Uh, and uh, but then then the everything uh, holds on to the width of the distribution, which is the standard deviation, which gives the size. Because if I now want to get the size, then I have to get the average r square, second moment of this distribution. Okay, so this is uh, one little bit on central limit theorem. You can find it on Google. Do do it do it in uh, 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 internet. You'll find huge amount of things on central limit theorem, but main thing is that in to be large. But as I told you, by 10, 12, you already have fairly good Gaussian distribution. This is one of the things we always use in computer to generate a Gaussian distribution. We generate 12 random numbers, we add them up, and the sum becomes the Gaussian. And that we use in computer. One of the things is that this is to be mutually uncorrelated. That means from one step to another, from monomer one to monomer two and monomer two. To Three, so one to two and two to three, uh, and they have to be independent, and that is guaranteed by uh, the rotational degree of freedom. Um, so then one can further quantify these things by taking the R along z-axis, then you project it <coughs> on the R, and you get L cos z i, and uh, 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 and then. Uh, and you take our end to end distance as their axis and then project on that. Then L cos L is the length. L is the monomal length or bond length. And theta is the one that orientation gives you. That's what gives you the randomness. So since theta is random, cos theta is random. And now we can do R square and I can evaluate the cos theta with 0 to pi. And I can evaluate the R square average. And that's exactly done here. That when you do that averaging, because uh, uh, I and J is, uh, these are on bonds. I and J are I'm doing on bonds. So one bond and other bond is uncorrelated. So then I have cos theta I J is just uh, one sum because otherwise it's a, so then we get N there. And so R square is NL square. So it's a beautiful result, a really beautiful result. So it tells you mean square is NL square. Uh, so for that, I don't need the, Gaussian distribution. For this, I don't need the central limit theorem, but I need the central limit theorem to get the distribution of R. And I, I can get that they are also through random walk. So there are two points here A that mean square, R square is scaling as root over N, which is an extremely important result because that gives you the size of the polymer. And then comes the distribution. So <coughs> the distribution is Gaussian, as I said here. There is a R square factor here. You know, I am asking the what is the probability that has, this is a little bit problem here that n should be capital n on both this side or small n on both the two sides. But uh, the, you will see these mistakes are not in the book, but there are a little bit more mistakes here and there in this in the slides. But which you go back and look. So the distribute the enter 
end to end distance r is uh, for capital n r should be there then this is distribution the, the probability that you have the end within a distance r and because of the spherical symmetry of the system so it is in a in a volume element in a shell that shell is 4 pi r square so at a position r it is the, uh, exponential minus 3 r square by 2 n l square plus the normalization but you have to multiply by 4 4 by r square okay so this is uh, this quantity that uh, this uh, uh, n to the power that this result n to the power half and that that um, um, size then you can do the radius of gyration this way and exactly the same way you can derive it is also the second moment you just change your uh, change your central of uh, your coordinate system and you again see that it is rg is root over n so but basic central result is the following that probability distribution is gaussian with three exponential minus three r square two n l square, and so standard deviation or the width of the distribution scale as root over n, and that is what we call size. So as I told you before, radius radius of gyration, which gives a good measure of the size of the polymer, and the mean square end to end distribution, they are essentially the same thing. And uh, so as the numbers, as I told you already, a polymer is millions and millions of monomers. That means n is upward of 10 to the power 7, say, or 10 to the power 8. Now, if L is a couple of Armstrong, then you can imagine that n to the power <coughs> n to the power half, n to the power 8, is 10 to the power 4. So if this is 2 Armstrong, then 10,000 into 2 Armstrong is essentially 20,000 Armstrong. So radius of gyration is 20,000 Armstrong. That is essentially a roughly a huge, huge sphere. So you can understand this monster, monster polymer is sitting in solution. And there are not one polymer like that, there are many polymers. So these monsters, 10,000, 20,000 Armstrong uh, uh, with the radius, nearly spherical things are uh, suspended in solution. So that's what makes the polymer solution thermodynamic so interesting. <coughs> it is not a binary mixture. It is a binary mixture, but it's a binary mixture where one guy is um, 10,000 times larger than the other guy. It is very important to get a sense of number that what makes polymer so unique that polymer solution, you have this big, big floating around and many of them will precipitate if they are not uh, preferably solvated and we see these situations in uh, uh, proteins you know in a folded protein is almost again a globular protein is nearly spherical but they are of course much smaller they are uh, a few hundred many of them uh, few, yeah, and so they are much smaller but even then in solution is a very interesting area so polymer solution stands out from Many times we say they are the same, it's not quite the same. Polymer solution is the polymers are much, much bigger quantities. Though we do map a protein into a polymer and use the language of polymer science or polymer chemistry to explain proteins. Okay, now, uh, now <coughs> this was done by uh, Falkenstein and Flory. Now, another beautiful calculation that Flory did, and this is just a gem. Florida said, okay, I wanted to find it in D dimension. He of course did it in three dimension, but he also did it for D dimension. He said, how do I find the size of a polymer in a D dimension? He said, okay, he has to now say, okay, as I told you that this polymer is a monster, it's a big thing. So there is a end-to-end -end distribution, end -to -end, there is an interaction between monomers. So interaction between monomers depends on the concentration of the monomers. So what is the size of the monomer? Size of the monomer r to the power d in d dimension, r cube in uh, three dimension, r square in two dimension. Now, if that is so, and if, mon if monomer has a volume b, then uh, I can consider that that. Uh, a concentration of monomer 
Uh, why I need the concentration of monomer? Because I need the density. Why I need the density? I need the density so that I can co consider interaction. Why I need density to consider interaction? Because when the uh, monomers are next to each other, they are close to each other, they are interacting and they are far from each other, they are not interacting. So interaction energy is proportional to square of the concentration. Now, where did you see such logic before? That where this interaction energy is uh, square, <coughs> square of the density of concentration. In class, I would have asked you and then I would have pestered you to come up with the answer and you ultimately, I would have got the answer out of you. But since I cannot do it now, I can, let me tell you the answer in Van der Waals theory. In Van der Waals theory, there is a repulsive term P plus uh, I have said then uh, V minus N B and P plus A, A by V square, N squared by V square. That's where exactly the same logic Van der Waals seems that in order to interact, both the two molecules should be in a small volume element. And in this, uh, what is the probability of them volume limit? If they are independent of each other, then one uh, uh, monomer to be there is the concentration or density. Second monomer is also concentration. So it should be product of them. Okay. So that's why concentration is so important, which is showed here in N by RD, which is the concentration. Okay. Now, uh, uh, in case of chain obeying, we know in this case, in this RD, if uh, it is uh, fluoride, uh, polymer or, 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 or Gaussian polymer or that is called ideal chain, then R goes to B to the power N to the power. In that case, the number of monomer monomer contacts can be very easily found out to be N phi X square by uh, because there are N number of monomer, so total number of, so you have a contact, one polymer, one monomer in contact with the other is uh, this N1 minus D by 2, you can find for the earlier one and uh, However, n is this 2 minus d by 2. Okay. So this is now what uh, we are going to. So this is, we will we'll continue with the logic in a, in a minute. Before that, let me consider the little bit now. I want to understand polymer polymer interaction in solution. <coughs> As I told you, it is suspended in solution on many occasions. Typically, the solvent is considered good solvent likes the solvent, then the polymer gets filled so well, and then a lot of solvent molecules come inside. So it is kind of a porous thing. So polymer has within itself, in its size, up to the body in that volume element, it has all these uh, polymer molecules. So the way we sometimes talk of that, okay, if polymer, polymer, the, uh, if the monomer polymer like each other, then there will be more uh, monomer inside, then effectively polymer and polymer is not going to like each other. However, if the polymer monomer, monomer of the polymer does not like a solvent monomer, solvent molecule, then they will get, push these water molecules out. And as a result, I'll find effectively, because the solvent molecules will put a effective force, then the two monomers attract each other. So, I have a situation, which is all devised by Flory, where depending on the quality of the solvent, good solvent or bad solvent, two monomers effectively, there is an effective interaction like each other or they don't like each other. So this effective interaction is the one which plays a very important role because if I don't want to talk of the solvent, I will talk later, but not in the beginning. So now I do something without that. So this is this. <coughs> I was saying the good solvent the solvent molecules come in and the polymer gets swelled in a bad solvent, however, it collapses. And there is actually a transition between the, uh, by, you can change the quality of the solvent by changing temperature. And at certain temperature, this transition takes place, which is called, uh, which is called uh, theta temperature. Okay, so this is the effect of solvent is very important. Uh, and you have it in the, you will get this, you will get the, uh, slides along with the talk and you can look at it and the of the derivation.